And let's pray. God, I woke up this morning with, um, with a word, I believe, from you. And, and then, uh, and then I, I came to worship and, and someone handed me a card and it had that same word from you. And so I, I believe this is a, a passage that, that we here this morning can receive from you. So I'll just read from Matthew 11. Jesus says to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I suppose if we whittle it all down, God, that's perhaps one of the main reasons many of us, has, many of us have come here today. We, we want to rest in you. We've labored, we've stressed, we've carried a burden, we've, we've gotten all, all muddy and dirty and tired this week, and now we come to you because we just want to find rest in you. So we take this moment to, to breathe out the, uh, the stuff that we brought in with us, to, to let go of, to quiet the noise that we've brought with us from our busy weeks. We ask that you would do that in our lives, that you would quiet, quiet the, the, the noise of the week that we've brought with us. And, and then we ask that you would you would care for us today. You would minister to us today, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today um, in the sense that, not in the sense that you need our permission to be here, but Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today in the sense that we want to experience you fully. We, want, we don't want to miss, miss out on what you have for us. We want to be able to leave today saying we, we truly met God today. We truly experienced God today. May that be the case. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. Move, move among us. We pray this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, so this is week two of a new series, and that new series entitled Letters from a Prison Cell. It's Paul's writing to, uh, to uh, an individual, Philemon, a very private letter. And then it's also, after we finish Philemon, then we're going to go to the book of Colossians, which was a very public letter. So we're looking at two letters, a very private letter, and yet it was included in the Bible, so it was meant, it was meant for us to read publicly, even though it's a very private letter. And then when we're done, we're going to look at the, 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 the letter to the Colossians, which was intentional, or originally a very public letter written to the church, and therefore, we can receive it as such. So there's this contrast between these two letters, which I find fascinating. But there's also this similarity or this uh, relationship between the two letters, the letter to Philemon that we're studying now and the letter to Colossians, which we'll study in a couple of months. There's this relationship. You remember, if you were here last week, the relationship is that Paul wrote them most likely at the same time in prison, most likely in prison in Rome, and he sent the two letters in the same knapsack. Um, this, this one of his one of his dear friends, one of his co-workers, took those letters out of Rome. Imagine, I I, I think about this often. I wonder if his name was, uh, I believe his name was Tychicus. Um, I wonder if he, I'm surely he didn't fully know, like, wow, I'm carrying God's word, and for the next few thousand years, people are going to be reading this. If I can just make it out of prison and make it out of Rome and make it to where I'm headed, then the letters will be public, and from now on, this will be part of the canon, part of the Bible, part of God's word. You know, that, what, a, what, a, what a significant moment in time, and yet he probably didn't realize it. He just thought, you know, I'm just a letter carrier, and yet God used that moment in time. So anyway, he was carrying, um, he was carrying the, the letter to Philemon, the letter to Colossians, and so that's why we've called this Letters 
from a prison cell. Some of what I'm going to be saying right now is review because, again, for the next few weeks, we're going to have people in and people out, and I want us to all kind of walk this path together. You can always watch last week on online, and, the, you know, they're always online. Um, a little more review. Um, most Christians have never been really taught um, the book of Philemon. It's very seldom preached, um, and I understand why. Uh, it's very seldom preached, uh, number one, because it's, it's super short. It's only one chapter. I mean, it's not even a chapter. It's just, it's just verses. Um, it's, uh, it, it's private um, in that it was regarding this very personal matter of how Philemon was to relate to his slave, probably his, his runaway slave. So, so, so there's that. The, why, 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 isn't, why is it seldom preached? It's short. It's, it's a private matter. And the third reason is that, that, that it's not often preached, I believe, is because Paul's intention, his exact intention, is somewhat uncertain. Like, is, 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 does he want Philemon to release Onesimus from slavery? Uh, d- does he want uh, Philemon to receive him back well as a Christian? That we know for sure. D- d- does he, is, is he speaking um, wholesale um, against the ill of slavery? Is he trying to abolish slavery altogether in the church? What, what is Paul's intention? And that... Does, doesn't really come through in a very exact way. What does come through in a very exact way is how Paul, the writer, wants Philemon, the slave owner, to now view this slave who has come to faith, who has become a Christian. That's going to play out over the next few weeks. It's, it, it's going to be a little bit vague because Paul, in the beginning of this letter, is just trying to for lack of a better phrase, trying to butter up Philemon, like trying to prepare him in the early part of the letter. You've written a letter before. You know what I'm talking about. Trying to get him ready for the zinger. The, you know, like what is, here's what I'm really asking of you, Philemon. So anyway, um, a paragraph of review. Uh, Philemon is the recipient, the addressee, the recipient of this letter. Uh, Philemon was apparently a man of wealth and of privilege. Another character which we haven't even read in the in the letter yet, Onesimus was Philemon's slave. You need to know that a large percentage of people in the Roman world in that day were slaves. When we hear the word slave in the, in the New Testament, we shouldn't think of the antebellum South and the type of slavery that we, ne- that we know tragically as a part of our history. I'm not saying that slavery in, the t- in, the, in Paul's time was a good thing, but it was a different thing. Many, many people were slaves um, in the system, in the economy of that day. So Onesimus had, 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 had apparently run away, and he had apparently through the providence of God, run into Paul, somehow come in contact with Paul, perhaps in prison. We don't know exactly, but what has happened is Onesimus, the slave, came to faith. He became a Christian under Paul's discipleship. And so so Paul is now sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And Paul's request is that Philemon would receive Onesimus back. And and this letter ultimately, eventually, tells tells Philemon um, how to receive him back. We're not going to get there for a few weeks, weeks, but we are going to get there. Now, a paragraph that we're going to put up, a quote that we put up last week, but it's worth putting up again. Here is the main point, because... 
we don't literally have slaves. Um, you may have an oppressive influence over somebody else. Uh, I don't know. But you don't, nobody here literally has a slave. But, so why would Philemon be a book that we would even study? And so here's a quote that we looked at last week from Doug Moo. This is the main point. One of the enduring and extremely relevant teachings of Philemon is the degree to which Christians are bound to one another in all their activities through their common faith. If you'll just leave that up for a moment. So, so here's the idea. While Paul will, will never get to in this letter to the point of, of outright um, calling for the abolition of slavery in the church or outright condemning slavery, not in the book of Philemon, while he never gets to that point, what he does is he creates this tension where we say, well, within the church, if, if, if we are, are to call one another brother and sister in Christ, and if we are to, as it says, it be bound to one another in all of our activities through our common faith, then is it perhaps no longer tenable where one person could say, I'm the boss over you. I'm, I am, you are my slave, and I am your master. So, so Paul really does this masterful job of, of, of creating this tension where I believe Philemon had to at some point say, like, I don't know that I can receive Onesimus back as a slave anymore because he's my brother in Christ. So as there's, this, there's this tension that at least alludes to the fact that Christianity and slavery, there's no longer a tenable sort of relationship that they could have. All right, so we don't have that. We don't have literally slavery. We do have uh, an underlying sort of class system that we all sort of live in and work around. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks, what that looks like in the valley. We're not getting there yet. But if I could just generally speak to that idea that, 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 that we are a room, even in the small group that we have today, we are a room full of complexities. <laughs> different walks of life, different socioeconomic statuses, different backgrounds, different history, uh, different stories. And you have probably uh, heard the phrase, we as Christians are called ambassadors for Christ, meaning we represent Christ, meaning that we are about the work of bringing peace, bringing unity. We're not called to, uh, to stir things up. We're not called to be guerrilla warriors. We are called ambassadors. We're also called reconcilers. So how does this message, this ministry of reconciliation play out in, in my life, in, in your life, in everyday life? Because like it's easy to get along and kind of hold your breath and be nice for an hour and right here in the room, but then, but then you got the rest of your week to live elsewhere where you can do whatever you want. And I'm not watching you, and to some degree we're not watching each other, how are we reconcilers, ambassadors for Christ outside of these four walls? One more quote, um, another theologian, one more quote, N.T. Wright, and then we're, gonna, we're going to uh, jump into the passage. Here's what he says. The reconciliation, that ministry of reconciliation, we're ambassadors for Christ. The reconciliation of Philemon and Onesimus in, in this book becomes an acted parable, a story that tells a bigger meaning, right? An acted parable of the gospel itself, which breaks into the world of sin and suspicion and anger, of pride and fear with the goodness that Jesus Christ has revealed God's purpose of salvation, of human wholeness, of loving and forgiving fellowship. So, so what is N.T. Wright saying? He, 
He is saying that, that this reconciliation that is to come between Philemon and Onesimus, but also this reconciliation that comes between you and I when maybe we don't even see eye to eye on a certain issue or matter or point. Or the reconciliation that happens in, in my home between, between my, my wife and me. Reconciliation across the table. That, that that reconciliation, when it happens in the church, it's a, it's a parable, or I might use the word a metaphor. It, it, it alludes to something. It, it tells a, a, a bigger story. It, 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 just like a parable. It, story that has a bigger meaning. When we get along, when we are reconciled to one another, what Dr. Wright is saying is that that is a, a it, it, it alludes to the gospel story itself because that's what Jesus does. Jesus comes to reconcile us to the Father, but that's not the entire story. He also comes to reconcile us to one another. And so when we're reconciled, it alludes to, it speaks to of how we are reconciled to God. That's really the main point of Philemon, and you'll see that unfold more and more over the next few weeks. All right, let's jump right in. We're going to read the second section of, of, of Scripture today, but I thought we would briefly, because we're unpacking it in such small chunks, let's read what we did last week, and I won't preach on that. I'll preach on the second passage. Here's what we read last week. The beginning of the letter. Every letter has to have a beginning, right? It says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Remember, I asked last week, so is Timothy writing the letter with him? Or why is Paul referencing Timothy? Paul, a prisoner for, for, for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to the recipient of the, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. I, soldier, I told you last week there's good reason to believe that Aphia is potentially Philemon's wife and Archippus is potentially their son. We don't know for sure, but there's, there's good reason to believe that is potentially the case. Okay. To Philemon, to Aphia, to Archippus, and the church in your house. So what do we know? There's a church that meets in Philemon's house. He's a church planter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, we already preached on that last week. If you didn't hear it, go online and watch it. Now let's go to, the, let's go to today's passage. Today's passage is a, the thanksgiving. And this is how letters were written in the Greco-Roman world. This is like a lot of secular letters that are extant today, that are still in existence today. We have an opening, and then we have a, a thanksgiving, and then we get to the point. But it would be rude to just get straight to the point. You've got to do an opening. You have to have an opening. Then you have to have a thanksgiving. And that's where we're today. And then next week we're going to start getting into the body, the point. All right. The thanksgiving, it goes like this. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the heart's of the saints have been refreshed through you. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so as I've already said, in the Greco-Roman world, the idea of uh, having a thanks, a thanksgiving section is kind of the bridge between the opening and the, the body. Real common, uh, no surprise. And it's also no surprise that in such a short letter, the thanksgiving is very brief. We have it as three verses. It's how we've, how we've marked it in our Bibles. So it's a brief um, thanksgiving. Now, while the thanksgiving focuses on Philemon, 
Remember, this is a private letter. It's just written to one individual, private matter. It still, nonetheless, has four elements. And so let's just briefly look at these elements there. Number one, Paul is going to express thanks for Philemon. You, you, you see this, and we'll read it again, but he's, he's going he's gonna to give thanks. And by the way, by the way I'm going to say this. If you have a, a responsibility in the future to write a persuasive, loving letter to someone, the Philemon is, is a case study. It's like, it, it is like gold. And if you want to, like you want to write, you're trying to convince someone, like with, with a good ethical heart, you're trying to convince someone to, to do something, to bring somebody back around, to bring them back to faith, to, you know, you should, before you write that letter or that email or whatever, you should go to Philemon. It is a case study. It is a good example of rhetoric and how to, how to convince people. Number one, he expresses thanks for, for Philemon in these three verses that we looked at today, um, or the, the, the four verses. Uh, number two, he reveals that he prays regularly for Philemon. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, no, number three, he explains why he's so thankful for Philemon. And then number four, he explains what it is that he is praying for Philemon. That's what is going on here. All right, let's go verse by verse. First of all, and, and you can just go back to the, to the passage now, and we're going to look at that. Verse 4 is what we're going to look at. First of all, he says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Now, last week I told you, Timothy probably didn't co-write this with Paul. I'll tell you why later, even though Paul says, I and Timothy, right? And, and one of the reasons that, that, that we're led to believe that Timothy wasn't writing this is because here, uh, in, in, in English, but, but especially in, in, in the Greek language, Paul uses the first person singular. He's saying I. He's not saying we. He's saying I. And it strongly suggests that when Timothy is included in that verse 1 earlier, he's merely saying he's my coworker. He's not my co-author. He's not the co-author. He's my co-worker. He's my, my partner in the faith. And so I, uh, I'm going to mention him. And yet, Paul seems to write this by himself. Significantly, when we study Colossians, Colossians seems to truly be co-authored by Paul and Timothy, but not this book. Um, and perhaps in light of the, na- the fact that this is such a private matter, makes sense that you write it by himself. Uh, and then it says that he always, and, and maybe just because I'm a, I'm a nerd, when I read this, and I love words, uh, and, and how words are laid out, uh, I've looked at it in several different, through several different lenses, and the question I always ask, does he, is he saying he always gives thanks, or he always Praise for, I thank God, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. The nature of the, of the Greek grammar is such that we don't know. Like, is he saying, I, I always give thanks for you, or I always pray? So I'm just going to receive it as both. Like, in his prayers, he is constantly giving thanks. Now, let, let's think on this. That is an impressive claim. How many times have you been like, I'm praying for your brother, and then you go around, and you're like, oh, Oh, God, please don't judge me. I just told that man that I was praying for him, and I haven't been. But if I start now, it'll count. Like, have you ever been through that? I'm sure you have, right? You tell somebody that you're praying, like, okay, now I really got to, really got to pray for them. But, but Paul, not but, but, Paul, he makes this impressive claim that he is remembering Philemon in his prayers constantly. Now, Paul says that, you might know, about uh, the same thing about many individuals and many churches in all of his writings. He is constantly saying, that, that, you know, so if Paul is not exaggerating in these verses, and I don't think there's any reason to believe that he is, then, then, then these verses reveal a man, Paul, who prioritized prayer for Christians all over the Mediterranean world. It's a testimony of 
Paul's view of the significance of prayer. It's an encouragement to us. It's a challenge to us. Oh, that we might pray more for one another and give thanks more for one another. And so it says that, that Paul remembers Philemon and his prayer. He remembers. That's, that's the English where he remembers. What does that mean to remember? Moses used to call on the Israelites uh, when he was leading them out of Egypt to, to the promised land. He used to call on them to remember in the sense that they were to remember the Lord's activity in their lives, remember the Lord's activity in their parents' lives in delivering them out of the bondage of slavery. And it's the same word here. I mean, different languages, but it's the same word where, where Paul is, is saying, I remember, I, I consider your needs, dear brother Philemon, uh, and I consider your need for God to act in your life, and I call on God to remember you. I call on God to, to meet your need, to act on your behalf, now, that's important because, because if you are trying to clear the hurdle of praying for, for a brother or sister, well, number one is just making the time. Like you say, man, I'm going to pray for you. And like with integrity, you walk away and you say, I really I want to do that. I really want to pray for this person. I told them that I would. And so you, you go away, you make time. That's the first hurdle. But the second hurdle is, okay, what do I pray about? And this is, this is a, a formula. You, you, you remember the, their very, the very deep needs that the person has, and, you remember, and, and then you pray that God would remember, would look on their needs, and would be for them all. He would act on their behalf. All right, that's verse 4. Verse 5, he goes on and he says, Because I hear of your love, and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and for all the saints. That's how the English Standard Version translates it and the NIV translates it. All of them, all of the, the versions translate it basically like that. They make this into a verb statement. It's actually a participle. Actually, it would, it would be uh, quite okay, quite appropriate for it to say... Um, hearing about your love, not because I hear, but hearing about your love, hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's doing, he's saying, here's, here's, it's because of, uh, here's the reason why I always give thanks for you. Philemon would, would in silence be asking, why is it that you give thanks for me? And he says, here's why. Because in my hearing about you, I've heard about you, and, 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 and the things that I've heard about you are good things. In hearing about you, I give thanks. He's, he's giving the reason for always thanking God in verse 4. And in the hearing, the participle hearing, in my hearing, I give thanks. The hearing is, to me, an interesting the reason uh, for giving thanks. Have you ever had somebody come to you and they'll say, like, oh, yeah, I've heard about you. And it kind of freaks you out, like, well, was it good? Was it bad? Like, what did you hear? Was it a lie? You know, if, you're, if, you're, if, your, initial, if your initial response, like somebody says, well, I heard about you, and like, well, what you heard wasn't true, then, like, then you're paranoid, right? But, but in this case, in this case, it's a very esteeming. Paul says, I, I've heard about you. I've heard about your love. Uh, I've heard about your faith. And Paul is des delighted that he hears good things about Philemon from others. He, he knows that, I, I believe that he knows that Philemon is a, is a good man, full of love and faith. But, but nonetheless, it's just good to hear others say that about Philemon. It brings Paul joy. As I understand that. Having a heart, the heart of a pastor, when you, you know, like, I, I know that, that, that you guys are loving, faithful people, but when I hear it, 
then it, it just, there's, a, there's a, an extra measure of thankfulness that wells up in my heart. When I talk to others in the community, and, and I'm told, and, and I get this, like the, someone will say to me, the people that I know that attend River Church, they're just such kind people. And, and I, I, I regularly get that, and I celebrate that like Paul. And when I get that, I, I say, yeah, all the mean people left River Church several years ago. We're all, we all, it's all the kind people stuck around, so that's why we're a kind church. Nothing will bring more health and wholeness to River Church like a few people who love others well. Nothing will be medicine for the soul of River Church like a few people loving others well. But Paul's actually hearing two things. It says, I, I, I'm giving thanks because I'm hearing two good things about you. He says, I'm in verse 5, I hear of your love and I hear of your faith. Your love and your faith. Now, considering the nature of this letter, what Paul is trying to do to, to ultimately, uh, ultimately compel Philemon to receive Onesimus back, given, given the nature of the letter, it, it's significant that Paul will, this is the last time he refers to Philemon's faith. No more in the letter. He, he, he said, he's I, I'm giving thanks for your faith, man, your faith in Jesus, but he's not going to bring that up again. For the rest of the letter, you can just trust me. You can also go home and read and look for it. He doesn't bring that up again. But he will refer to Philemon's love three more times going forward now in the rest of this extremely short letter. He's going to mention faith once, but his love today and three more, a total of four times. The intent is clear. The intent is to compel Philemon to, to be loving, to be gracious toward Onesimus. He's compelling. He's saying, on the basis of your reputation, man, like you're a loving fellow. People, people tell me, I'm, I'm hearing this, that you are a loving fellow, that you, you love people well. And so I'm on, on, on that basis, on the basis of your reputation as someone who loves others well, ultimately what Paul's going to do is say, based on that, I'm going to ask you to love Onesimus well. I know you're good at it. I'm going to ask you to receive Onesimus back with the same kind of love that marks your reputation in the community. Moving on, verse 6 says this, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may be effective in deepening your understanding. I'm sorry. I'm reading from a different translation. I've got several translations here. Let me read it again. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Did I read that right? Right, right, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, what I want you to know is this. This is, not just by me, but by, by many scholars, this is considered the most confusing verse in the entire letter to Philemon. Confusing in the sense, of like, what's he trying to say? Like, it's a little bit wordy. It's a little bit confusing. It, 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 it. So I want to take um, a little bit of time and unpack this. I, now, I, now I'll read this. Now, now you know why I have several versions. I've got the, uh, somewhere in there, we've got the NIV, the New International Version. Uh, and I think in this case, the New International Version, um, they're, all good, they're all good translations. Uh, I mean, the, all of the ones that we use. I, I, I tend toward this one a little more. Here's what the NIV, how the NIV translates verse 6. It says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith uh, may be effective 
in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Still kind of confusing. What's, it's real wordy. What's he saying? I think what he's saying is this. Your fellowship, your, your, your partnership in the faith, not, not just your faith, but your, your, your fellowship, your partnership in the faith, it leads to a deeper understanding that of everything that is available to us in Christ Jesus. In other words, you will never fully grasp all that is available to you in Christ Jesus outside of the context of the church, outside of your relationships. If you never have relationships with other believers, if you're not in fellowship, if you're not partnering together with other believers, you're just a a lone wolf sort of Christian, then you will never fully, completely comprehend all that Christ has for you as a Christian. You have to partner with others. You have to fellowship with others. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. You see what I'm saying? See, See how I'm interpreting that? Fellowship, the hard work that Paul is about to ask Philemon to undertake. He's about to ask Philemon to undertake fellowship, partnership, reunion with Onesimus. And that's what we all need if we're going to fully grasp all that Christ has for us. We we need to partner together. We need to fellowship together. We need to come together. Together now, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm going to remind you of a word that we looked at months ago, uh, maybe September, and it's uh, kononia. And that's the that is the Greek word for fellowship. Koine Greek is common Greek, the idea of this commonality that brings us together, this fellowship, this common bond. It's not based on our incomes. It's not based on our skin color. It's not based on our affinities or our hobbies. This common koine, this common bond that brings us together is Christ Jesus. So koinonia is the fellowship, the common bond between us. Fellowship, the NIV uses the word partnership. It has this sort of effect on a believer knowing fully all that Christ affords us. It comes from fellowship. Now, fellowship for many people, fellowship for many people just means hanging out. The enjoyment of another person's company or the the enjoyment of a group's company, just hanging out. But biblical fellowship, biblical kononia, It goes beyond that. It goes beyond hanging out and killing time. Biblical kononia goes beyond merely being concerned for one another. I mean, that's a step. That's a step beyond just hanging out is actually being concerned for one another. But biblical fellowship, biblical kononia moves into the realm of interchange caring for one another, sharing with one another. When I act on my concern, that is biblical fellowship. When I'm just concerned about you, it stops a bit short. When I act on that concern, the the, the church in America has been built on the assumption that we don't really want to come together and give. We, we, really, we really want to come together as a church and, and get something out of it, right? So I'm going to come to church so that I can get a message, I can receive some encouragement, you know, Depending on your, 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 your place in life, I can receive some uh, free child care for an hour because my kids are driving me crazy. Like, like, so the American church is built on, and I, 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 
you know, I'm probably as guilty as, as many. But, but the American church is built on the assumption that we don't want to come together and, and, and share and care for one another. We really come together with this desire to be cared for. And I, I get that. I understand that. I understand the, 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 the sort of proverbial limp that we all bring with us when we come in here, needing, needing to be cared for. But, but fellowship, in a biblical sense, is when we come to care for others, not simply come to be cared for. Second Corinthians chapter 1 says it like this, pretty, pretty well-known passage. It says, if, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. That's koinonia. That's fellowship, partnership in the biblical sense. When, when is the last time you were discomforted or when you, were, when you suffered? Um, for someone else here. And, and, and many of you have recently. La- last year, um, it may have been several years ago, I had this string, this period of time where uh, I, was, uh, I was, I was meeting with a lot of people, not a lot, with several people who needed an extra measure of counsel and friendship and encouragement. And I was, I was getting a little tired. And I, I think I need to, because it was, it was over a stretch of time. Like, I'm, not, I'm not spending enough time on my sermons. I'm not, I'm not a, I need to be home in the evenings with my family. And it was just a, it was just a relatively short period of time. But I was... I was somewhat distressed. Now you say, well, hey, Randy, you, that, you get paid to do that. I know, that's, this is my job, right? But it was a moment in time where I was distressed for your comfort. And actually, that's a big part of being a pastor anyway. That's a big part of what I do. But it is also something that you, as Christ's followers, are called to do. You are to be that for others, to be distressed at times for the comfort of us. And, and by the way, then, 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 then the way that God has designed the church, there are other times where others are distressed that you might be comforted. Another quote by N.T. Wright, we looked, we looked at a quote of him uh, by him earlier, and it says this, the idea we need to grasp, the theme that dominates this letter of Philemon is that in Christ, Christians not only belong to one another, but actually become mutually identified truly rejoicing with the happy and generally weeping with the sad. That's what it means to be brothers and sisters in Christ is that there is this this mutual identity. Autonomy, you know, the private individual uh, self is something that we... uh, you know, the independence of our spirit is something that we as good Americans all believe in, and I do too. But you should know that that is primarily a Western concept, and it has really wreaked havoc in the church. I am my own person. I can come in here and be autonomous and then leave, and nobody needs to bother me, and I'll go, go about my own life. Pretty much a Western concept. Um, and... The, the biblical church was designed very, very differently where there was this mutual identity that they found. So, um, if, I, if Philemon allows this, 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 this concept of mutual exchange to rule in his heart, he will certainly be on his way toward receiving Onesimus back in love. All right, finally, we're going to wrap this up. Verse 7. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on verse 7, but verse 7 is Paul ultimately buttering Philemon up by, by, uh, before introducing his ultimate request, which begins next week in next week's sermon. Um, and that is you receive your wayward slave back. But, but, but in this verse, he just continues to, to encourage him and 
butter them up. You know, honey is more attractive than vinegar. And so Paul in verse 7 is honoring the beautiful truth that Philemon's love has been a source of encouragement, joy to Paul. And specifically, specifically, he says in verse 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed. This is where we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna finish today. The hearts of the saints. I'm going to put up some funny writing on the screen. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the original, uh, the Greek word for heart, and then the English, the English trans, I've forgotten the word, transliteration, the, the, how we spell it in English. That word is splankna. It's, it's our hearts. Actually, it means a lot of things. It means like your guts. It means like your, your innards. Means like the very, like the central core of who you, the most important aspect of who you are. And Paul is saying that, that, that Philemon, he's saying, when you love others well, hearts have been refreshed because of you. That, that the inner parts of the people that you encourage have been refreshed. And you should hear that. When you, when we gather together on Wednesday nights for our gospel community meals, or when you stick around after church and you encourage someone, you help, you, 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 whatever, however you help, with encouragement or with money or with resources or with time, that, that you, what, you, what you should know is that in the, in the very deepest inner parts of others, they are refreshed. I don't know why this mic is doing this today. They're refreshed. We're, we're, we're ending on this word splankna today because it's going to come up several times over the course of the next few weeks. This word is important as Paul will use the same word in verse 12, we'll get there, and in verse 20, we'll get there. It's the seat of emotions, the deepest, most significant level of one's being. So, so in this verse, in verse 7, he says, Paul is encouraged because Philemon has refreshed the hearts of the people. It, it's, it's a very parental sort of statement. Like, like in, in our house, we've got five kids, and three of them are still, uh, they're still dependents of ours, living under a roof, two adult kids. We've got five kids. But if you have one kid, or if you have two kids, one kid and cousins, whatever, You've experienced this in our home when we see one kid being the peacemaker and everyone else is refreshed. They're like, man, I want to hang around with you because you're encouraging. You're refreshing my heart. It, there's such joy in seeing that sort of fellowship in the home. That's what Paul is talking about. The word for heart, splankta, it's significant in that Paul uses it in the entire New Testament, only eight times. And three of those occurrences are in this one short letter. All the letters that he wrote, eight times total, three of them he used in Philemon. So later on in verse 12, he's going to say this. Get this. This, is, this will be a teaser for where we're going. In verse 12, weeks from now, we'll look at it. Paul is going to say, Onesimus, your runaway slave that I'm sitting back, Onesimus is my very Heart. That's how much he loved Onesimus. He's my very splankna. He is my very heart. He's going to say that. And then, and, then, and then toward the end of the letter, in verse 20, Paul asks Philemon, Philemon, you've refreshed other people's hearts. Philemon, would you refresh my heart by receiving Onesimus back? It'd be like if I came to you and I said, you know, you refresh other people's hearts. I see you do it all the time. Would you do something for me that it might refresh me, my heart, Pastor Randy's splankna? We're going to get there. That's what he's going to do. Okay. I'm going to ask you three questions, and um, if they're hard questions, just understand I'm asking myself, and they're hard questions for me too, and then we're... We're done, and then we're going to go to the source 
the source of our, of our faith and our sanctification, and that is Jesus Christ. We're going to go to the source as we celebrate the table of communion. Here are the three questions. I'm one, are you known by your love in this church? Are you known by your love in this town? Are you marked by that? Would, would others say that of you? Is that your reputation? Do people know you in that way. Number two, do you, um, I'm sorry, um, do you inconvenience yourself so that others might be comforted? Are you like, nope, I got to get to Calacas and Cerveza. I got to get out of here as quick as, you know, or, or are you a person who slows down and says, I'm going to make myself available. Maybe make myself available to suffer at times on others' behalf, knowing that others will suffer on my behalf also. And question number three, very related, would you consider yourself a kind person? Now, I read these and I'm like, man, I'm uh, borderline failing grade on all these myself. Like, the point isn't for us to be discouraged. The point is for us to realize that we need Jesus. Jesus is able to do this in our lives, to make us encouragers, to make us brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll end with this passage and we'll pray. Know this, that Jesus, he's able to make you into that person. It says this, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. All that you need can be found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we celebrate today this beautiful gift of, of fellowship, of partnering together for the sake of the gospel. Um, we celebrate the fact that you've designed us not to live independently and autonomously and privately, but as Christ followers, you have um, you've designed us to live as brothers and sisters. That's hard for us, God. You know, you know our hearts. You know that it given the culture we live in, given the country that we live in, given the time period that we live in, it's hard to be open and honest and in fellowship, that we tend to be private people. God, would you, would you work that out in our church? Would you make us a people who, who in the deepest sense, fellowship, do lives together? Would you, by your grace, do that in our lives? pray this in Christ's name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup and he gave thanks. He celebrated. And he said, from now on, when you do this, remember me. And so that's what we do to today. We gather together to remember Jesus. On that night, Jesus, he broke the bread. He, he held it up. He gave thanks. He blessed it. He shared it with his disciples and they ate and he ate. And he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. On that same night, he held up the cup. He, he blessed it. He gave thanks. He shared it with his disciples. They drank and he drank. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. From now on, when you do this, remember me. And so that's what we do, Jesus, with heads held high. We celebrate you. Uh, you were not a victim. You were a conqueror. You conquered sin and death, hell and the grave. And so we celebrate you today the simple act of the bread and the cup. My friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you in a moment to the table of communion. If you've not celebrated communion with us before, we have a little, we have a little cracker and we have a little cup of juice and you take them and you consume them when you're ready to. Um, you are welcome at the table of communion today, not based on membership. It's not based on that. You're welcome not based on perfection, 
else none of us would come. You're, based, you're, you're welcome at the table of communion today based on your submission to Christ. Maybe even a day, like love broke through and you have submitted your life to Christ. For the first time you say, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. If that's you, then you're welcome at the table of communion. Um, so I invite you in the quietness of the moment uh, to, to take a moment and check yourself. And then I invite you to come. Come and eat. It's good for you.